Hatcher. I work for the Farmington Museum and I'm in charge of the Riverside Nature Center. And today we're doing a little talk on some of the traditional uses of wild plants in our area by Navajo people and Hispanic people and early Anglo settlers and some of the things that we still do today. So to, at the beginning, because it will take a little time, I'm going to tell a little about dyes. These are the dyes used by Navajo weavers to make beautiful rugs and wall hangings and things. And this one is all dyed with dyes made from plants that are right around here. And I'm just going to mention a couple of them. And we're going to try a couple of them that work. Now, every weaver has a lot of dyes that she knows and uses and knows just what the recipe is that she wants to use. And normally, a weaver would cook the dye and then after it's cooked long enough, strain it to get out all the bits of plants and things and use the pure colored dye and boil her wool in that. Just because we're in a hurry here, we're just going to cook the wool in with the plants. So it won't make such a clean dye, but it will work. And this that I'm putting in here is rabbit brush. You may call this chamisa. Around here a lot of people call it chamisa. I don't use the word chamisa because that's the Spanish word that means brush. And in different parts of New Mexico and Arizona, different brush, kinds of brush are called chamisa because it's just the predominant one. Around here in Farmington, rabbit brush is usually what people call chamisa. And I just picked this right outside here, the flowers and the stems, and I'm putting it in a pot of boiling water. And before we put our yarn in with it to dye our white yarn, I'm going to add what's called a mordant. Mordant is a chemical that causes the color from a plant to adhere to an animal fiber like wool. And what we're using here today is alum, A-L-U-M, which is aluminum sulfate. Um, I just buy this at the grocery store. It's sold in the spice department because it's used making pickles to make them stay bright colored, green or whatever color the vegetable was, and crisp. So it's used in pickle spices. But I'm using some in here because it will work the same way to make our dye stay bright and colorful. So I just put the rabbit brush in here and it's going to cook in there. And here go a couple pieces of yarn, white yarn. I'm going to poke them in there to cook with our rabbit brush. So this is a kind of a quick and dirty, hasty way of making dye from rabbit brush. And later on, we'll take it out and see what we get. Um, now, I'm going to put some more alum mordant over here in a second pot and puts a little bit of yarn in it. This pot is cooking bark from ponderosa pine trees, like this. Ponderosa pine bark makes a dye, and I'm going to put some alum mordant in there. Now, if I were really a weaver dying for my own weaving, I would know exactly how much alum I wanted to put in, and I wouldn't be just guessing. But we're going to do it this way, and we're cooking our ponderosa pine bark, which is already in here, in with our, with our white yarn to see what that gives us for a dye. So let's just let these dyes simmer a while while I tell you about some other interesting things. 
this first piece of Navajo weaving that I showed you, um, the nice dark reddish brown is made with, with ponderosa pine bark. And this light tan color is actually made with the same kind of dye, but the um, but probably a second time. You know, when you get dye, the first batch of yarn you dye and it comes out darker. And if you put more dye, more yarn in it later, that batch of yarn comes out lighter. And so we got the light tan that way. I am not sure what was used for the uh, yellowish background, although I know several things that might have been used. And the green, the greenish around things, is probably the same dye as the yellow one, but with a different mordant. Alum makes this nice yellow, but there are lots of different mordants, and usually the things that are green the mordant that the weaver used was chromium. Uh, when cars had chromium on them, Navajo weavers used to collect chrome trim off of wrecked cars and things just to cook with their dyes. Now you can buy chromium to cook with dyes and make uh, use chromium mordant. But lots of other things are used too. Copper, like pennies, or from wire, and um, iron, and other things like urine makes a mordant. So different weavers know their own recipes for the colors they want to get, and that's how they do it. Of course, some colors are made because the sheet came that way. And this little weaving, this was made by a little girl. It's one of her first rugs. And the gray stripes in it are just the natural color of a sheep, and so are the dark brown stripes. Those are just the natural color of the sheep. Here are some scraps of wool of all different colors of sheep. People who do a lot of weaving sometimes raise their own sheep just to get the special colors. This is from a dark brown sheet. This is wool that's all spun. It will probably be spun again to make it finer, but that's ready to use. And that's a natural sheet color. And if you card together the wool from, say, white sheet and a, a dark brown sheet, you can get a light tan color sheet of wool, which I think is what this is in this little rug. And it's just by mixing some of the natural colors of sheep. Two Gray Hills rugs are famous for being made entirely of undyed wool of different colors carded together to get many, many different shades. But some people dye things and get beautiful colors that way. This little picture of the mountain called Pedernal near Abiquiu Lake is made by an Hispanic weaver up there, a man who prides himself on using only two dyes. He makes huge rugs that sell at the Spanish market in Santa Fe and have 10 or 15 colors in them, all made from just indigo, which is a plant he grows, and uh, the plant that we call Navajo tea, or Spanish people's word for it is cota. And he makes all his dyes from indigo and cota that he produces himself and gets many different shades. And of course, cards them together and, gets, and uses the natural color of the wool too. So this little piece with all those shades of blue and tan and yellow in it is made with just two dyes because that's this particular weaver's pride and special way of doing things. This is the kota or Navajo tea plant 
that this weaver uses, and it's growing out here right now. We could use it to make dye of if we wanted to. It makes many different shades of yellow and orange. Here are some of them. And tan, depending upon how long you cook it, and whether you let it soak in the water for a while after it cooked. Every weaver knows her own way of doing these things. Um, this is some of the plant growing right out here. And I picked this just yesterday. In English, it's sometimes called green thread. It has tiny little yellow flowers, which are like the centers of a daisy without the ray flowers around them. And when it's at this stage, you can pick it for dye or to make Navajo tea and drink it. Usually, you pick a stem of it and then fold it up back and forth so that it makes a little folded bundle. I think that's just so it will fit in your teapot. And you fold it up and dry it. You always let it dry before you make tea to drink. And then you can cook this with water and it makes a delicious orange colored tea, which is very nice to drink. You can make iced tea of it also, but you always dry it first. And these are just the way they were growing just yesterday out here. It's almost through blossoming. When you pick coca, um, you pick just one stalk off of each plant. Don't pick the whole plant or pull it up by the roots because there won't be any more. So you just pick one off of each plant. This is from two plants. But we could make it to drink too. And people even sell it. Now, while our dye is cooked, let me tell you about one other dye. This I'm going to bring up close and hold up. Sometimes, you may see a cactus, a prickly pear, or a choya, which seems to have little bits, it looks like little bits of white tissue or something stuck all over it, as if wet Kleenex blew onto the plant or something. This is a dried cactus. Those little white bits are actually a tiny insect, which is black, but it makes a little white foamy cover for itself to keep the sun off. These are tiny insects, like aphids. They suck juice from the plant. But inside the insect, if you squeeze it, is dark purple. Here's a little tissue that was squeezed around one of these insects. The insect is called cochineal. And it makes pinks and purples. Now, it takes a lot of them to make dye, but here are some samples of pink and purple dyes dyed with cochineal from right around here. Cochineal has quite a story. When the uh, Spanish conquistadores came here, they found that in Mexico and Central America, people were, were collecting these cochineal insects by scraping them off of the cactus and cooking them to make dye, and they had beautiful red and purple and pinkish colors from it. Now, red and purple and pink were such hard colors to get when everyone in the world used only natural dyes before there were chemical dyes. In Europe, these were so expensive and rare that the Spanish were very excited about this. And they, they collected cochineal, dried the little insects, which are tiny, and shipped them back to Europe to become pink and red dyes. And they got cactus plants with cochineal insects sucking on them and brought them north because the cochineal didn't live normally this far north, but the Spanish brought the cochineal north to, uh, to New Mexico 
and started putting it on cactus plants that they raised in and around where they had missions and things. This is just some dry leaves cut off of a yucca plant. Native people in this area used yucca plants for all kinds of things. This little leaf was made into a paintbrush. But you could strip the leaves down and make fine, fine thread in them, which people used to sew. And here's a little piece of twine made from yucca fiber. It's braided, and you could sew with that. The seed pods on yucca are pretty, and people make decorations of them. But when the fruits are small, before the seed pod is dry and open up, people could eat them. One of the other fun things about yucca is that the roots, and here's a piece of yucca root, make soap. In Spanish, it's called amole. And it's, if you take yucca roots and knock the bark off of them, I think the traditional way is to hit them with the back of the ax, and the bark comes off, and then the root, which is stringy and fibrous, you can mash and flatten out and squish it in water, and it works very well in cold water, and it makes suds. And that's used to wash wool, and people use it to wash their hair. And Navajo people still use it to wash their hair for very special ceremonial occasions. You have to dig up a yucca plant to get the root, so there's a lot of work involved. But it makes wonderful suds. And before there were better, easier things to use to wash wool with, which you could buy um, at a feed store or a trading post, uh, yucca suds was what was always used to clean wool before you dyed it and used it for weaving. Some of the other things done with yucca is that it makes beautiful baskets. Besides making string and twine that you could sew with or make sandals of, it makes baskets. And I have just a few here. This is a Hopi basket. And it's dyed probably with cochineal. But this basket is made of yucca. And if you look at it, you can see that it's, it's yucca leaves. This little flat tray is a basket made by Tohono O'odham people in southern Arizona. And by gathering the yucca at different times of year, they can have it dry, darker, a little tan, or very white. And that way they make a design on their basket, but with using yucca that they carefully gathered and dyed at different times. And they have to do that. Plan to gather your yucca when it will make different colors so that you can make something with it. And that little miniature coaster is made that way. This is a different kind of Hopi yucca basket. This is coil and stitched over and over with yucca, which is mostly white. But the design is the yellow, probably rabbit brush, that the yucca was cooked in the diet, and the red, probably cochineal because the Hopis gather that too to make dye. The black is from a very special kind of wild gourd that we call devil's thorn, um, which grows and is very black. And if you peel that, this skin from these skinny wild gourds that grow on the ground, that gives you black to make black basketry material of. I am not sure whether that was what was used on this Navajo basket or not. This, um, 
this miniature Navajo wedding basket has red and natural yucca and black. And I'm not sure what they use, but that's probably uh, also cochineal and, and thorn, black thorn. And this is an, a Navajo basket. Now, the quail part inside this Navajo basket that you can't see because the yucca stitching covers it all is probably a plant that we call three-leaf sumac that grows right around here. Um, we, uh, we Anglos, I, I grew up calling it lemonade berry because the little, the little red berries on it, if you taste them, taste like lemon. And if you put a bunch of them in water and squish them in it, it makes it taste like lemonade. It's interesting to notice how these baskets are finished. The Hopi baskets are just stitched around and around at the edge very nicely, very neatly. This one too. And the Tahona Odhum basket is stitched over with a decorative stitch at the edge. But Navajo baskets always have a pattern at the end, a little crisscrossed pattern like this. And this one has two. That little crisscross pattern is supposed to remember and honor juniper trees, which are so important in all sorts of Navajo things. And this looks the way juniper branches look with the leaves overlapping each other in that pattern. So I can always tell a Navajo basket because the edging is finished in that very beautiful way to honor juniper trees. What we call the berries of the juniper, little bluish purple seed things, can be eaten. Now, some of them taste very good and sweet, and some of them taste like turpentine. And different trees have different flavors. Uh, but juniper berries can be eaten, and um, they are, they're, I have found that the birds who eat them always eat the sweetest ones first. So if there are lots of juniper trees, you watch which ones the birds are eating. And those are the good ones if you want to pick them and eat them. The birds don't eat the bitter turpentiny ones until the very end of the winter if they can't find anything else to eat. And that's the way we do it too. If you take the leaves from a juniper, the branches from a juniper, and burn them and catch the ashes, you get what's called well, you get juniper ash, fine gray ashes. And fine, juniper ashes are used in cooking um, at like baking powder, but they're especially important to cook when you're cooking something made of blue corn. Because if you cook blue corn without putting juniper ash in, it doesn't stay blue. It gets sort of a a sickly grayish pink, not nearly as nice a color. So if you get blue corn chips or something like that made with blue corn, they were probably cooked with juniper ash. And you have to have that if you're going to make blue corn things stay blue. So we use it for that too. The other thing about juniper is that Inside these berries, there is a seed. And the birds eat the berries, as I was saying. They eat the tastiest ones first, and drop the seeds. And when the seeds are on the ground, there's a kind of a mouse that comes and gets the juniper seeds. The mouse wants to eat the little nut meat out of the inside of the juniper seed. And so, the mouse bites a little bite out of the end of the juniper seed and eats the little inside and leaves the wood, 
the woody shell of the juniper seed sitting on the ground, usually in a pile because the mouse gathers them and sits in one place and eats a whole lot of them and leaves a little pile of the woody shells of juniper seeds. And they find the little wooden shells of juniper seeds. They already have a hole in one end from the mouse and that you can take the other end and rub it on a piece of sandstone or a nail file and that makes a hole in the other end. Fortunately, the mouse always makes its hole in the round end of the seed and so you have just a pointy end to rub on a nail file and make a hole and then you have a bead. And little children gather these beads and take them or sell them for people who want to make necklaces of them. I'm wearing a juniper bead necklace where the brown woody juniper beads are strung in between green beads and this is one where they're strung very decoratively with bunches of white beads. And you can buy these many places. Uh, and I always think they're a wonderful bargain because if you buy a juniper bead necklace, you're getting something that was made by a tree and a bird and a mouse and a little kid who found the, the seeds and whomever strung them. Maybe that little kid's grandma or somebody. So for whatever you pay for a juniper bead necklace, you're getting the product of a lot of things and they're fun to wear. Um, I was going to mention that at, in, during the time of the Dust Bowl, the 1930s, Russian olive trees were introduced in this area. Those are the trees with the grayish leaves that grow a lot around here in our park. And they have little fruits on them, which Navajo children call monkey eggs and which you can eat. They taste like very dry raisins, but they have a big seed inside. Because this is a recent introduction, there aren't a lot of traditional uses for them, but some people have found that you can gather the seeds from Russian olives, and they make nice beads too. This necklace is Russian olive seeds, but they're very hard to strain. You have to soak them in boiling water before they're soft enough to poke a needle through to make a string. So you don't find Russian olive beads very much. They're an awful lot of work to make. But sometimes you may find some somewhere and they're very pretty to wear. Now, let's, while we're talking about juniper trees, besides beads and, cult and ash, juniper is used, some of it, in making cradle boards. And this is a little toy Navajo cradle board. But this nice arch here over the top, the rainbow part, is made from juniper. Juniper wood has beautiful colors. And so these little toy cradle boards are made with juniper. And that's one of the other things made. Now the other plant we have lots of here and all over the reservation and all around here are pinyon trees. Most of you probably know pinyon trees. And the thing we know best about pinyon trees is that in their cones, which are little and round and flat, there are pinyon nuts, which are very good to eat. So that, and those used to be a very, very important part of the diet. And here's a, a pinyon cone decorating a little basket, which is actually made of needles from another kind of pine. But pinyon cones and, and nuts are the most famous thing. But pinyon trees have gummy sap in them, which we call pinyon gum. And that, if the tree is damaged or cut or something, the sap oozes out. Here's a dry lump of it. it smells pinyony. And um, that sap is used in a lot of ways. One of the things is that there's a traditional Navajo cream made from pinyon gum, dissolved usually in 
uh, in sometimes in, in mutton fat, but generally dissolved in, uh, now it's usually dissolved in coconut oil or, or Vaseline, the pinyon gum, and it makes a, a healing salve, which is very good for blisters and scrapes and skin irritations and things like that. One of the other things done with pinyon gum, and it takes a lot of it, is that it's used to waterproof baskets and pottery the Navajo way. Um, this basket, this is a replica that I made, but it's like a larger Navajo water jug because people made a basket using three-leaf sumac and yucca all sewn together and then to make it waterproof so you could carry water in it they put pinyon gum melted pinyon gum and put it all over the inside and outside of the basket and um, and that's what this is these are horse hair the little handles on the basket navajos used to make much bigger ones of these to carry water in and some people still do, but it is a lot of work. And uh, it's, so, it's a very difficult thing. This is not a very good one. I made it, and it's kind of messy. And I didn't clean the pinyon sap well enough, so it sort of has bits of dirt in it. I've seen much prettier ones. And the same thing, when pottery is made and fired, while it's still warm, the potter can put pinyon gum in the pot and all over the outside of it, which makes the pottery glazed and waterproof. The pottery isn't fired at such a high temperature that it becomes waterproof all by itself. And the pinyon gum helps waterproof it. So these are two little Navajo pots. This one has a, a dragonfly on it, and they're waterproofed with pinyon gum. So that's another thing we get from pinyon trees. Besides, of course, pinyon firewood, which is very, very good for making a fire. Now, let's look at a couple of other things that grow wild. The, the wild board is called buffalo board, and they're just round like this. They're sometimes called coyote gourds. And those gourds can be used and are used for all sorts of things. Um, these are a couple of pretty little decorated bowls made from coyote gourds, carved and painted. This one was burnt, wood burnt. Sometimes those little bowls are used um, for lots of things, and they're just decorative. I've got this little one, which is an Easter basket, and I put it out every Easter in my house. Um, also, Native Americans in this part of the Southwest domesticated a kind of gourd that grew with a, a little handle on it that could be used as a rattle or a scoop or a water dipper or this actually is an early Anglo pioneer thing made from a gourd like that. Someone used it to carry lead shot in for his gun when he was hunting and so it's a, it was a shot gourd and lots of people use those that you had to carry you had to carry your ammunition somewhere so that was in a gourd so those are wild gourds or the ancient domesticated gourd the things that were domesticated around here were gourds and cotton and uh, sunflowers our wild sunflowers that we have around here are the ancestors of all the sunflowers in the world. 
even the huge ones that Russia is famous for, and the ones that grow fields and fields and fields in China and in Kansas. The ancestors of them are the wild ones we have here, which have little grayish-purple sunflower seeds that taste very good, just like sunflower seeds. And actually, those were sometimes used, particularly by the Hopis, for dye. But they're the ancestors of all the world's sunflowers. They came from here. They were domesticated by Native Americans. Let me mention a couple other trees. We all know cottonwood trees. And you may know that roots of cottonwood trees are one of the best materials for carving. Now this is just a little souvenir carving made from cottonwood root. But kachina dolls and things like that are all made from cottonwood root. And the, the cottonwood root almost doesn't have a grain in it and it's very soft and light and easy to carve. So carvers for centuries have used cottonwood roots to make things. A couple of other things. This is grass. Now this is an old style Navajo hairbrush. And it's made from a special kind of grass that you have to gather and dry and tie together to make a hairbrush of. Sometimes there's another one made to use like a strainer, a sieve, for old style cooking. But it's a special grass that people know how to find and gather. And the other thing that we see that's this, there is a, a shrub, a tree called greasewood. And a lot of it grows here in the park. Greasewood is used to, it used to be used to make arrows when people had to hunt with bows and arrows to find their food. Greasewood was used for arrows. And it, because it's very lightweight but very strong and hard. And so this was used that way, but now it's still used to make Navajo stirring sticks for traditional cooking. And I have a picture here of a young lady stirring, stirring with stirring sticks while she cooks. One of the other things about greasewood is that people know that greasewood grows in places that get flooded every few years. It'll, it may be in just a big valley where the, when there's uh, snow melt off, the water drains down into the bottom and temporarily floods the bottom of the valley. Or it may be in an area where a river overflows sometimes. But grease, where greasewood grows, you know that every, oh, maybe 10 years or so, it's going to be a flood. So people know that's not a place to build or to put your mobile home because sometime during the next 10 years you'll have a flood there if greasewood is growing there. So it's an indicator tree and that's a valuable thing to know about it also. Now a couple, I want to mention a couple of other things. Um, I mentioned that yucca root was good to make suds to wash your hair. This is another plant that was used to wash hair. Right over here, this plant, not this, this plant with orange flowers you may be familiar with. We call it globe mallow. It grows everywhere. It grows all over town in open spaces and wastelands and, and around houses and things, has orange flowers. And a traditional use for that is that if you gather those stems of the plant and cook them in water and cool the water and use it to rinse your hair when you wash it, 
it brings out the reddish highlights in brunette hair. Uh, in Spanish, it's called yerba de nelicrita. And here is actually a bottle of shampoo I bought, I think at Walmart, that has that in it. It's, it is especially meant for hair that you want to bring out the reddish highlights in. There is another plant I couldn't gather to show today that if you boil it and cool the liquid and use it to rinse your hair, brings out the blue-black highlights in brunette hair. So it fascinates me that back when ladies spent their time growing their food and they spent half of every day grinding corn and they made their clothes and they had to do all the things in their house by hand, they still found time to find out that there were plants you could gather to use to make your hair prettier when you washed it. I think that's just fun to know. Um, another plant we find around here, and it is a sort of a small tree, is willow. Most of you know what willow trees are like. And most of ours that grow along the ditches and things here we call ditch willow or coyote willow is the commonly used one. And that's used in a lot of things too. Um, the traditional ute cradle board has a hood, a shade, this is a toy, tiny baby one, a shade made of little willow branches. That's the shade over the baby's head on a ute cradle board. And those are gathered from willow trees. Another thing that's been done everywhere is willow stems. They can be used to make baskets, but they can also be used to make fun willow animals like these. And willow animals made like this have been found that are more than 5,000 years old. People made them and put them in caves and rock places in the Grand Canyon. They were probably made in, in conjunction with prayers, either prayers of thanks that there had been good hunting and lots of animals, like deer and antelope, to hunt for, or maybe prayers that there would be lots of deer and antelope to hunt for. But willows were used for that, and they are still found in archaeological sites, very, very, very old archaeological sites. This plant, which grows all over the park here, is called lamb's quarters. It has little sort of arrowhead-shaped leaves. And in English, it's called lamb's quarters. Many people know it by the Spanish name, quelites. Q-U-E-L-I-T-E-S. And it's a kind of wild spinach, which grows wild here all by itself. Now at this time of year, some of it is as tall as I am, and it's getting seeds on top. The seeds, when they're dry, can be gathered and eaten. But what most of us like to do with it is pick the leaves. And when the plants are small, and just full of these little leaves. The leaves are very good to eat. As I said, they're wild spinach. You can eat one. They taste naturally salty. And deer like them, and people like them. Many people in the spring gather them and freeze them to have to, to eat later. That's what I do. Once the plant start, gets ready to make seeds on top, the leaves don't taste as good anymore. There we go. There's our ponderosa pine bark wool. Is this nice, pretty brown. To use to make a rug. Now let's look and see what's in our rabbit brush pot. Oh, there it is. Get the 
rabbit brush there. Here's the yarn. Now, because we didn't strain our dye beforehand, we would have to rinse this. There may be little bits of dirt and plants bits stuck to it. So we'd have to rinse this and dry it again before we could make something of it. But look at the nice colors we got. Gold and yellow and a nice brown. In just a little while, cooking them in a pot with our plants and some mordant. <laughs>